Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome yet again to one of my videos. This afternoon is unusual and I'm going to be taking a look at something which I've never um, made a video about before, um, which is um, some of the philosophy from the Far East, uh, as we occasionally call it, from China. Um, you may know that China's Chinese name is Chunghua, um, and that we, we, what I'm going to be talking about here is is Chunghua's greatest son, uh, the philosopher, sometimes referred to as Kung Fu Tzu or Kung Fu Tzu, otherwise known in the West as Confucius. Oh, yay! I've never done this before. Uh, Confucius is not that difficult to to explain, but there is quite a bit to it. So, let's begin. So what is to be said about this? What was very interesting is the context of the dates from which uh, Confucius's work comes. He's, he's from the 4th, uh, 5th fifth and 6th fifth, fifth centuries BC. So what we're talking about here is some two and a half thousand years old in terms of its or origins. Uh, which places him somewhere near, I suppose, the time of the initial uh, developments in ancient Greece. So this is a very old philosophy. It is one of the foundational philosophies of the world, and for some reason or other has been neglected in the West, if not parodied at times. You know, people like to uh, make jokes about Confucius, he say, you know, in a, in these days in a way that somehow would be uh, frowned upon. But his work is tremendously important in understanding the position of China within the world and the position in particular of, of modern China and its way of operating within the global system of relations. So there is more to Confucius's work than meets the naked eye. He is he's more important to understanding how Chinese ethics, Chinese morality, Chinese politics, and Chinese society operates than one would imagine. So where to start with all this? Confucius in himself is a is a not a difficult person to understand. He, he was born into a sort of kind of Chinese middle class camp family. He, he was initial in his initial years because of the death of his father. He was brought up in poverty and later on worked in a variety of menial jobs, uh, including cow herd and things like that. And uh, eventually through his own hard graft and good luck, which is typical of, of people of the type. Um, having lived within a period of, of change, he managed to work himself up into a, being a, 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 a civil servant who uh, did quite a lot of job within the pre-imperial Chinese state. This is the time before the, the, the even the development of something called China. You may know that the Chinese name for, for uh, the place we call China is Zhongkuo, and its deriv derivation of that name comes from the, the emperor who unified it in the first place, usually referred to as Chan. And Chun, or Chan, was the uh, the, the dictatorial emperor, emperor who finally brought what we now think of as modern China into, into place. But then, the, after his death, China yet again fell into a degree of internal struggle. But having created that situation, the idea of China as a as a as an empire of, of of cultures became embedded in the system of, of 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 oriental history and china is a very diverse place i mean we tend <laughs> yeah you know, and there's an irony about it all that you know, that we tend with to think of china as being a bit like uh, I don't know, like america you know lots of different states but everybody's kind of chinese it's not true china is a bit more like um, europe in some ways or africa in the sense it's got very very diverse cultural differences across its geography and its vast population very many uh, languages are spoken many many dialects of languages are spoken and the whole idea of it being a, a unified system which has got this central monolithic process going on is to a certain extent a bit of an exaggeration sure the Chinese Communist Party have made it one unified political system but underneath the surface, there is a huge main amount of diversity within China, even to today, depending on which part of China you happen to be in at the time. 
So it is like Europe. It is a bit like Africa. It is a bit like America as well. It is. A, it has a, a slightly federative look to it in terms of the way in which it operates. But again, as I said earlier, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party makes it into this modern state called the People's Republic of China. PRC, if, if you want to call it by its official name. Where does Confucius in all this? Well, as I said, he was from the pre-imperial period, warring families period, in many ways, where aristocratic families were in at odds, at odds with one another. And one of the reasons he came into being and why his philosophy became so important was as a means of trying to provide some degree of stability and peace within a system that was in constant state of chaos as people struggled over power, struggled with, with each other, and struggled for their own self-interest in some respects. This meant that at the end of the day, there was a need for an underlying philosophy which would make China, or at least the, the regional culture in which Confucius grew up, a part and parcel of a, of a stable state that has some future to it. Because of the, the situation at the time was pretty desperate. Rural princes may have lived and may have lived and ruled at the time in a nominal way, but in fact they ruled through through powerful families who each had a share of power within the rural within the local system and those local systems in themselves were in a constant state of instability so Confucius comes along at a time when there's a need for some philosophical binding together as you might say and it's that process that that makes him into something important in this period and then this is the surprising thing, remains important thereon because of the, the nature of the work that his acolytes and his followers and, and those philosophers who came after him uh, 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 also did. A famous one that comes afterwards is, is called Mencius. Uh, and Mencius, in some respects, is a post-Confucian philosopher who, in fact, enhances the, the Confucian way of thinking and becomes part and parcel of the whole tradition of, of, of Confucianism. So, in reality, Confucianism doesn't stop with Confucius. It con continues to develop down through the generations and down through the ages, which is why it is, in a sense, a complex philosophy. It has had lots of layers added to it, like an onion. <laughs> it has lots of layers added to it over the generations, and has become more and more complex because of that. If you want to look for where most of the core philosophy of of, of, of Confucius comes from it. It's in the Analects. Uh, these were not written. This is a book. These are a book of of sayings and statements and 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 and, and you know uh, diatribes and various uh, 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 analyses of of Confucian thought. This particular set of writings were not written during his lifetime, but written after his death. So in some respects, they have about the same sort of relationship with Confucius as the Gospels have with the life of Jesus Christ. They are accurate up to a point, I suppose. But in some respects, they also contain the gloss of another person's interpretation within them. So, you know, Confucianism, like Christianity, has its interpretations. What are the core issues here? Confucius was not a revolutionary. He didn't believe in upset of overturning the whole of history and establishing a whole new social system, a whole new political system. In fact, he was quite conservative. He strongly believed that the, that the individual had a place within a, an ordered system of social structures. And those ordered systems of social structures were highly dependent on things like family, community, loyalty and in particular loyalty in a historic sense. Loyalty means something more sim much more complex than just the business of doing what you're told because your family tells you to. There is more to it than that. There is a sense of origins built into loyalty, a sense that the person feels themselves and considers themselves and believes themselves to be part of an ongoing history which they have come to through the past actions of their parents parents, grandparents, and, and, and others in the, in, in the distant past, and which they will pass on to future generations. That sense of tradition, that sense of orderedness, that sense of being part of something that matters, is essential to the, to the processes of, of, of Confucius. He believes or asserts that this is not about 
overturning anything, provided order within a system, and that system is innately conservative. His idea of his ideas of loyalty are also related to hierarchy. There are certain kinds of hierarchy which he thinks of as natural. So, for instance, to have a ruler, an emperor perhaps, a prince, a duke, a aristocratic individual who one plays, one pays fealty to, 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 to a large extent, if you were thinking it in the feudal sense, is a natural order of affairs for him. He believes in these that leaders of that type are vital to the structure. He also believes that below those particular those elements are allegiances based upon the idea of not just family but also to community. But family always comes first, and especially family in terms of ancestral family, the tradition of a family, the honour of a family, the sense of a united vision of what one is based on one's inheritance. It's something vaguely familiar to all that. I mean, for a Jody, I mean, as somebody from the northeast of England, I can understand that. Why families in the northeast have played a huge part in, in the way in which uh, northerners often see themselves. There is a kind of sense of, of of gravity towards family that you often find within northern families. That that you know who they are and what they are and how they operate as a group is just as important to to many traditional Jodies as as does the per person themselves. So the, you know, this is this is not unfamiliar. It's just, it's very much core to what, what Confucius believes. Con uh, around this is tied up in all that, this idea of how does one, ex how does one enact the business of these senses of loyalty and the sense of knowing your place within this structure is this concept of li. Li is often interpreted as, as a rights. It's kind of like a really difficult thing to, to explain if you're not... <laughs> I suppose you're not Confucian and you're not Chinese. The idea of rights is is something that even would exist today. We we have them, just we don't think of them as rights. Rights are like the kind of ceremonial positions and activities and traditions and concepts and exchanges that go on in society that enact one's respect for others, one's respect for the past, and one's loyalties and judgments about relationships that one has. The rights are in some respects a bit like the kind of way we in a, we today would think of as politeness, having 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 not just R I T E S rights, but R I G H T S rights. There's an there's a slightly comic idea, but you know, it's it's this ironic idea that the two sound the same, but in fact have something in common with one another. We would think of rights or IGHTS as vital to a modern com concept of society. But rights in, in within them have certain rules about engagement, about how one talks to another person, how one respects them, how one defers to them or expects deference in terms of respect. Those sorts of relationships that one has within society based upon hierarchical position, relationships to others, uh, expectations and so on, happen within our society. If you're, if you're, of course, if you're arguing from the point of view of anarchy and part of an anarchist, some an anarchist would see this as the worst aspects of society. Confucius, on the other hand, sees this as really, really, really important for him. Those structural systems engaged in through the idea of rights our IT, yes, is a really important aspect of, the, of maintaining how people relate to one another. So, for him, in you know, as a fifth century, sixth century China, BC, you have this interesting idea that uh, for him a right would be how one dresses, how in terms of one clothing, how one relates to events in terms of, for instance, you know, how long would one would. Uh, a mourn after a death in the family, that there are certain traditional ways of doing that, how one respects one's ancestors, how one respects one, one's superiors within the social system. And this rule of rights applies to everyone. In other words, there is no exception within that. Those rights are supervening even above the emperor. The emperor is expected to operate within them, and he's expected to show the same sort of deference to the concept of rights as as anyone else. Now, this is interesting because if you refer it to the modern age, then it, the same supervention of of, of of moral behavior is something we would all expect. 
politicians and people in power to have. In fact, one of the biggest things that one objects to in modern society is the idea of morality of politicians often seems to be lacking. Therefore, from the point of view of a modern Confucian interpretation, the rights, R-I-G-H-T and R-I-T-E-S, of modern society will be based upon the idea that we will expect to show respect to politicians, but in return, politicians would be expected to show respect and to us. And this exchange, this reciprocity for, for Confucianism is a vital aspect of the way in which the, 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 the philosophy uh, is engaged for, 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 um, for Confucius in his own day and age the idea, this, this idea of reciprocity is a vital exchange in terms of valuing how one operates within society. If, if people don't do this, if people step out of the bounds of this reciprocity, then the whole society falls apart. It's necessary for everyone to behave in a certain way in order to make sure that the communicational engagements that people have with one another actually provide the kind of understandings that enable us as a society to function. So out of this, all this comes something which we probably today would find objectionable, the idea of knowing one's place. For, for Confucius, the idea of knowing one's place is a natural, a natural thing. But one is supposed to be good at knowing one's place. One is supposed to be good at what, whatever, whatever one does. If one is a peasant and knows one's place, one is a good peasant. This, they still respect the rights. They still respect the idea of, and they still demand respect from their help, from their upper, from their superiors. Oh, their uppers, their superiors, in terms of the way in which they 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 interact reciprocally with others. In other words, it's very in, in Chinese society as Confucius saw it, the emperor must treat his subjects with respect, value and love them, and operate in their best interests. And they will do likewise. His idea is this virtuous behavior spreads down through society, not through the business of preaching and teaching, but on the basis of example. So Confucianism is a very exemplifying philosophy. It's how you behave that matters, not what you say. Because how you what you say cannot be valueless, but how you behave demonstrates your Moral, moral position within society. And that's for everyone to do, irrespective of whether they're very rich, very poor, or anybody in between. Those sorts of relationships, in some respects, generate their own impetus in terms of the moral order of society and how people treat one another. Of course, it's a, there's a certain perfectionism built into all this, you know, the idea that somehow this is all going to happen. But, got to admit, there is a certain sense to it. So there is Li, there is Li, the idea of rights. There is a sense of structure. This, this is a structural system. Also along with this, there is the idea of virtue. Virtue is something Confucius is fascinated by. Funnily enough, so is Aristotle. And there is a certain parallel between the two. They both think in terms of, of virtue. Virtue is not something you can really... It's not something you can teach, it's something you do. Virtue is right action. Virtue is, in a sense, moderation as well. Virtue is the business of having certain behaviours that illustrate the fact of your moral behaviour, your moral standards. So a, a person with, with virtue would be kind, would be gentle, would be forgiving, would be um, loyal would show respect, would have a uh, conscience, and stuff like that. These sorts of things would sound you know, idealistic in some respects on, are not expected to be seen in terms of some sort of inner mental consideration, but are supposed to be exemplified in society by action. In other words, the whole business about being a Confucian is not just to think it, but to do it. In that sense, Confucianism has often been interpreted as if it was a religion. Confucius talks as if there were, in the Analects, talks as if there were gods. But that's only partially the case. He sometimes completely ignores the whole business of the gods entirely. And in many ways, only does it in a sense of a symbolism. The idea that somehow 
God himself, if there is such a thing as God himself, it, it also acts in the same way as an example of behavior that you would expect human beings down on earth to. So there is a sense that, 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 that it's not, Confucianism is not so much a religion, there aren't really any religions, but later commentators on, it, on, his, on his, his, his work have often interpreted it as if it might be. Confucius's approach to the business of men and women is unfortunately not particularly enlightening. He believes that women need to obey men. Yeah, tough. This is, as you might expect, not particularly unusual. You probably would have found exactly the same thing in ancient Greek society. Uh, and certainly in, in, the end, in the end of the day, this is unsurprising when you consider that the rest of his system of structures is based upon this whole idea of, of obedience and loyalty. Obedience and loyalty being strictly indicated by the way in which society operates. So, traditionalism to a great extent. So, what I've got there is a, is a very, very broad stroke picture of, of, of Confucianism. There's lots of other stuff that goes in there. Um, for, uh, Confucius, for instance, one, was one of the first um, philosophers to come up with something equivalent to the golden rule you know, do unto others as you would do, have done unto yourself. His version, often called the Silver Rule, is slightly different from that. His version is, do not do unto others that what that which you would not want done unto you. And my personal view is that's actually a really good one to keep, to pick up on. It's 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 a it's written in the Analects and it's part and parcel of Confucian thought, and indicates something about this business of doing. It's about not so much about thinking about things, but about doing. There is another issue, uh, something which needs to be made clear, and that is that for Confucius, one should do something not based upon uh, having a reward for it or because one was going to be punished, but one should do something because it is the right thing to do. In other words, it is not right to have a society in which punishment is the only way to get people to behave virtuously. If punishment is the only way you can get people to behave virtuously, and clearly they're not virtuous. And therefore it's very important that in the business of structuring society, people should want to behave in a certain way, should want to behave outside the realms of reward and punishment. To do good, to do good for, for Confucius is to do good because good is a good thing to do. Not to do good because it's going to look good in your CV. Not to do bad uh, and so refrain from doing bad, not because you can get punished, but because bad doing bad things is a bad thing to do. These these issues, I suppose, are, uh, are, are again are, are part and parcel of a process that, in many respects, Westerners would find familiar but difficult. So, how does this cascade down through the ages? Modern China, in some respects, and especially Chinese communism, has is not as um, Easy to understand, as you might find, might think it is. Um, during the period of Mao's rise to power, his version of communism was very often welded together from a number of different sources. He he knew full well in his in his battle for 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 the Chinese soul that the, you know he was building it on a long tradition of other philosophies, not just the one of. Of Marx, and in the process of doing what he did, he welded in various aspects of, of Confucianism, especially with relations to the business of structure and loyalty. So in modern China, there is still a sense of knowing your place, knowing your loyalties to superiors, being honourable in the way in which you operate in terms of your relationship with others, and innately knowing what the right structural behaviour is. This can, of course, mean that for people coming to China, uh, from the West, for the first time, may find Chinese behavior sometimes a little bit, you know, difficult to comprehend. Chinese people can sometimes be, you know, especially traditional older Chinese people, can sometimes be difficult, to, difficult to to get. You know, the whole business of Chinese inscrutability, for instance, is based upon this whole idea that that, that in many ways the the communicative relationships people have with one another in China are not the same as the ones we have in the West because of the nature of the inheritance of Confucianism, because of the nature in which these particular systems of loyalty and virtue and, and, and the rights still exist. I mean, the rights of modern China are not <laughs> are nothing to do really with the old ones of how, what you wear and how you behave with the superior, but they're very much to do with all the old business of 
one's relationships to one's family, to one's friends, to one's workplace, to one's community, in the hierarchical order, and to the Chinese Communist Party. So there is, in some respects, a very much a proto-Confucianism concept running through the middle of, of, Ch of Chinese society, which has got a lot to do with how Maoist thought works. Maoist thought, because it had to encompass vast society with many different cultures, with many different social strata, is more nationalistic. It is more traditional. It is more involved with the business of, of how to interpret Marxism in a way that soldiers, peasants, and you know, you know, uh, uh, proletarians and uh, slightly more middle class intellectuals would understand it and encompass that. So there is, it is blended with a degree of Confucianism, but it's th that that blend is never absolutely on the surface. It's always below the surface. It's always below the surface in the way in which relationships are enacted within modern China. Modern China also has a kind of paternalistic side to it. You may have noticed that in terms of the way in which. Chinese Communist Party intervenes in just about everybody's life. But this is nothing new. The whole idea of paternalism and the business of one, you know, of loyalty to one's direct superiors, and often this was one's father, but also to other 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 individuals within society, still forms part of the way in which in which Chinese traditional thought operates. So it's not surprising that the paternalism of the Chinese Communist Party is is, is still very much part of the way in which one China works. I'll leave it there. Hope you found that useful, interesting. Lots more, loads more stuff in the handouts. Uh, there are three handouts. One of them has got some of, of Confucius's sayings. Great one, really good ones. I really, I, I pan picked those because they, they are, I think they're really good ones. Um, there is a, a quasi biography, and there also was a handout on on on, on Confucius himself. There is a lot more to this, far more than we can cover in this particular video. I recommend you also watch the video by Oliver Thorne on Confucius too. He adds, I haven't, I've tried not to cover exactly the same ground. Uh, what I've also tried to do is to cover it, when it does touch the same material, to cover it from a slightly different slant so that I create a third dimension for what he has to say and vice versa. Please do go and have a look at what Oliver Thorne has to say you know, on YouTube in his channel called Philosophy Tube. Okay? Have a good week. Thank you for listening. And do take care out there. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye now. Thank <laughs> you.